you know, as we're going to be talking about end times over the next couple of weeks, um, I don't know what, what that does to you, just even that topic, what, what you think about when, uh, when you, you hear that we're going to do a little series on, on what, uh, what the end times are going to be like. Um, but it's, a, it's definitely a topic that's intriguing, you know, it's interesting, it's confusing. Um, sometimes it's even divisive as people get pretty uh, dogmatic about what they believe and say how it absolutely has to be. Um, but, but the truth is, is when you read scripture, you, you see that the reason why Jesus speaks about the end times is because he wanted it to be motivating. Not just interesting or, you know, and intriguing or whatever else. He wants it to be motivating. He wants it to motivate us to live a, a, a godly life. And I know in my life, okay, here's what I've done, and I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure most of you have done the same thing. There have been periods in my life when I think about the end times, okay? And I will get so fired up, and I'll start thinking, man, it could be any day, any day, any day. But then that usually wears off until something else happens or someone else talks about it or I start talking about it, then I think about it again. And then, you know, I'll go months, sometimes even years, without really thinking about the return of Christ. But it'll be in little spurts. And, and I guess as, as, as we talk about this in the next two weeks, I, my prayer has been that it won't be just another temporary hype. You know, I remember the first time I thought about end times was I, I was a new believer. I was, you know, in high school and someone explained to me the prophecies of the end time. And, and, and I started looking at current events and I was like, whoa, this could happen at any moment. I heard a couple of speakers speak about it. So I really, you know, would spend the, a whole week thinking Christ could return any time. I want to live my, right, my life in the right way because he could return right now or right now or now, you know. And I'm just thinking every second and I'm like that, but then it just kind of wore off. And then things would happen, or I'd hear a message, or I'm trying to think, uh, the, the Gulf War years ago, Desert Storm, I remember when all that was happening, I was like, whoa, everything's centered in the Middle East now, it's all, you know, the, the whole oil embargo and everything else got me thinking, this could be the end, you know, you know, maybe now is when the Antichrist is going to come, you know, I get all fired up and nothing happens, okay, okay, you know, and then I forget about it again, and then, uh, you know, something like, like, like the earthquake in 94, you know, you just think, ah, oh, the world's coming to an end. Everything's falling on me. You know, it's, it's over. And then, you know, you, you just kind of forget and you just get comfortable again. And then 9-11. Uh, 9-11, I, I guarantee you, many of you guys thought about end time events, right? You just think, what's going on? Everything's falling apart, you know? What, what's going to happen next? And you just hear about one tower falling, another tower, you know, the Pentagon. You know, it's just like one thing after another. You start thinking about it again, but over time you forget about it again. And then, uh, you know, recently with all the current events, there's part of me that, you know, wants to hype it up again. Like, come on, you know, this could happen. This could be the time. Let's get all fired up. But really, you know, what God wants is for this consistent readiness. Okay, not this up and down, you know, all fired up here and there. I mean, there's a part of me that's tempted because you know that one of these times it's actually going to happen. You know, it could be this time. It's like, you know, do you walk away from that slot machine or do you put one more quarter in, you know, because maybe this is the time, you know, and the next guy, you know. But, but, but it's, it's almost like that with the end times. It's, it's like, well, maybe. You know, maybe I should get us all fired up because maybe it is going to happen tonight. Maybe it is going to be tomorrow, you know, and, and there's that side of me that wants to hype it up again because it really could happen. And you look at the things in the world and you compare it to Scripture and you go, gosh, it's so set. It is so ready. Anytime Christ could return, and he really could. But I really believe that, that what Scripture teaches is about this consistent readiness that we should live our lives in such a way just regularly not in spurts, but regularly in such a way that we're expecting and eagerly awaiting the return of Christ. Having said that, I can, you know, I'm going to be honest, I'm not there. You know, like I, I just shared, I, I go in these spurts where I think about the return of Christ and then I won't think about it for months. And, uh, and, and is it possible? I'm praying. I'm praying that, that, that we all kind of grow in this together and, and try to live lives in such a way that we're, re we're ready for the return of Christ. Um, it's just hard. It's hard, to, it's hard to think about everything changing and everything we know of just changing overnight, isn't it? I mean, if you're my age, 
or, or younger, I, you know, and you grew up here in, in America, it just seems like everything's been the same in a lot of ways. You know, there have been little changes here and there, but it's hard to imagine the whole world system changing overnight because we've lived in such comfort, really. I mean, we've had our individual pain. You know, each of us have experienced our own tragedies, but as far as our country and, and just the way the world works, to us, it's just, it's going to be the same tomorrow because it's always been the same. You know, when we talk about the world changing, it's, it's like, that's so unusual. I mean, the things we sit around and talk about are like, wow, can you believe how quickly Walmart was, you know, put up? Yeah, you know, to us, that's the big change. Or can you believe, you know, the construction up there on the hill? Can you believe this? Can you believe, I, you know, and it just seems so trivial. And it's so hard sometimes for me to, to visualize or to picture the return of Christ and these things happening. But, uh, but we need to. This passage that we're, we're in, in Luke chapter 17, is when uh, Jesus uh, is asked about the end times. He's asked about what's it going to be like at the end of the world? What's it going to be like when the world changes as we know it and your kingdom comes? And, uh, and he's speaking to two groups. He's speaking to the Pharisees, who are kind of Jesus' critics, you know, the skeptics, and then he's also speaking to the disciples who are his followers. And it's interesting because he'll speak to the Pharisees first and say one thing to them, and then he turns to his disciples and says something different to them. He kind of adds to it. You see, in Luke chapter 17, verse 20, it says that once, having been asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, Jesus replied, the kingdom of God does not come with your careful observation, nor will people say, here it is or there it is, because the kingdom of God is within you. Okay, so first you've got the Pharisees. These are the religious leaders, and they're coming and they're kind of testing Jesus. These are his skeptics. These are his critics. These are, the, he, these are his enemies in a lot of ways. And, and they come to Jesus, and they're asking him, when is this kingdom of God going to come? Now, what they're talking about is in the Old Testament, it talks about the Messiah. It talks about this one that was sent from God who would come and reign over the earth. And he would actually be over all of the government, all the government of the world. He would reign, and he would bring that peace to the world. He would be the ruler of the world. Okay, the Bible predicts it. The Bible says it's going to happen. It is going to happen. And so the, the, the Pharisees are saying, hey, when is that going to happen? When is this ruler from God going to come and kind of overthrow the government and take over this world? Jesus' response, you know, when they're asking about the kingdom of God, he knows what they're asking, but his response to them is, listen, first of all, he says, the kingdom of God does not come with your careful observation." So he's saying to these Pharisees, look, you're not going to be able to, the word careful observation is to spy or, or to, to, you know, to watch closely. Okay, he says, you're not going to be able to go spy and figure out the exact day to tell all the people. And maybe the, the Pharisees thought they were going to do that. They thought they were the religious leaders. They were going to figure this out and tell the people when the Messiah is going to come. And Jesus says, look, it's not going to come with your careful observation. But then Jesus says something else to them. He says, nor will people say, here it is or there it is, because the kingdom of God is within you. He's telling them the kingdom of God is within you. Jesus kind of changes the subject a little bit, okay? Because the Pharisees, their intention is they want to know about this, this end time when the kingdom of God in that sense is going to be set up on the earth. Jesus changes and explains to them, look, what you need to be worried about right now is the fact that the kingdom of God is right in your face, in a sense, and you're not seeing it. The kingdom of God, that word within you, I, I know some of your Bibles say among you, but the, but the word uh, literally means to be within your grasp. It's like the kingdom of God is right there in your face, and that's what you need to figure out. It's not about figuring out when it's going to come or, or when this is going to happen, but the very fact that the kingdom, in a sense, because the kingdom is wherever the king is, and the king was right there in their face, and he says, you know what? The kingdom is right there, right within your grasp. I'm right there with you. And um, it's, it's similar to, remember, uh, we, we studied this in Luke 12. In Luke 12, verse 50, uh, 56, 
Luke 12, verse 56. Remember that passage where Jesus says to the Pharisees, um, you hypocrites, you know how to interpret the appearance of the earth and sky. How is it that you don't know how to interpret this present time? Remember that we talked about how these people, they were so good at knowing the weather and knowing when it was going to rain or this or that. You could look at the sky and you could figure it out. He goes, how can you not figure out what's right What's going on right now, this very second, the fact that the Messiah is before you. It's kind of the same thing that he's saying to the Pharisees here. He's saying, you've got to understand that the kingdom of God is within your grasp. And that's what you need to be concerned about. But then he goes on. Okay, so, so Jesus, it wasn't like Jesus thought the Pharisees were asking, hey, when is, uh, you know, when's the kingdom of God going to be around? Or, or when can I have this relationship with God? Jesus understood they were talking about end times, but he was saying to them what they needed to hear. See, the Pharisees didn't need to concern themselves about future events. What they needed to concern themselves with was what was in their face, the fact that the kingdom of God was right there. And in the same way, as we talk about these future events, the thing I hope is that some of you, you really don't need to know a whole lot of details about the future. You've got enough issues right now, okay? You know, I mean, your relationship with God is just in the tank. I mean, it's just garbage. You you know, you you don't even have a relationship with God, whatever it is. You know, so I don't want to distract you and go, ooh, I want to figure out when Christ is going to return. Because the truth is, is just like those Pharisees, you need to deal with what's in your face, you know, and, and deal with those things first, and then we'll go on to the other stuff. And that's what Jesus does now when he, he starts talking about uh, to, to the disciples. Okay, this, this is very important. He, he tells the disciples about the future kingdom. Okay, now he starts getting into the, you know, a little bit of the prophecy and a little bit more about the future, but he only says that to his disciples. He addresses it to them. And this is very important material. Okay, it's, it's head knowledge now. It's information that you got to understand. Okay, the disciples, it was important for them to understand, but it's very important for you to understand because this. There have been people that have made some fatal mistakes in life based upon their lack of knowledge in this area. In fact, uh, you guys remember Pastor Peter from Uganda? You know, I brought him, you know, he came over and he preached to us and you know, I, I remember him sharing with me once. He says, you know, here in Uganda, and, and he said it, and he was so brokenhearted over it. He says, my people are being killed because of a lack of knowledge. He says, Francis, a lack of knowledge is destroying my people. He says, do you realize that not too long ago that, that this, this, this religious leader came and, and just started gathering all these people to himself, some of my people, started following him, and he was telling them that Jesus was returning and that Jesus wanted to meet with them. And so he took them out, you know, to this hut out into, you know, in this forest. You know, he goes, about a thousand people got them gathered into this building telling them that Jesus was going to meet them there. And then they torched the building and killed a thousand of my people. He says, why did they go? Didn't they know the scriptures? He goes, but they don't. The people here don't know the scriptures. They don't know what the Bible teaches, so they make these mistakes, and they go after this teaching or that teaching because they don't know the truth. He said they know very little. And and that's what prompted us to go and and do the pastor's conference because the pastors wouldn't even know. You know? You know, that's... Whoa, what was that? Okay, anyways. um, I was trying to ignore it, but I just kept thinking, what in the world was that? Okay. (laughs) Okay, anyways, um, so uh, someone's like playing a Game Boy and you unplug the, the little earphone piece. But um, <laughs> just got it. Okay, um, okay let's, let's, go, <laughs> let's go to the passage. Okay, because it's true, okay, it, it's true. In, uh, in Africa, these people were... Uh, they were, they were deceived, but the thing is, is a lot of people even here are deceived. Okay, you've got to know these next few verses. Okay, Jesus says to his disciples in verse 22, it says, He said to his disciples, The time is coming when you will long to see one of the days of the Son of Man, but you will not see it. 
men will tell you, there he is, or here he is. Do not go running off after them. For the Son of Man in his day will be like the lightning, which flashes and lights up the sky from one end to the other. But first he must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. Okay, so now he kind of switches gears because he's talking to his disciples now, and he's telling them about the future events. But, but the first thing he says to them, he goes, there's going to come a day when you're going to long to see one of the days of the Son of Man. He's telling his disciples, there's going to come a time when you're going to want to see that day when Jesus, I mean, don't you want to see that? I mean, don't you want to just see, gosh, life on earth with Jesus ruling? Okay, he's in charge of the moral standards. He's in charge of what's right or wrong, and it's not just the majority or guessing or this or that, different people's opinions, but it's going to be Jesus ruling. Okay, and he tells his disciples, there are going to come days when you're just going to want that so badly. You're going to want to see that day when Jesus is ruling on the earth, that millennial kingdom that's talked about in Scripture, where Jesus sits on the throne on earth. He goes, but you're not going to see it. And, and I think he's, you know, it's pretty clear that he's saying this to his disciples because they're going to go through a lot of persecution, right? When, when Christ leaves the earth later on, I mean, m you know, most of these guys are going to die a martyr's death. And they're going to see a lot of evil in the world. They're going to go through a lot of pain. And during that time, can't you just imagine them just going, man, I wish the world weren't this way. I wish Christ would just come, sit on the throne, and make everything better. I wish that he were ruling the world right now physically on this earth. He says, you're going to want that, but you're not going to get to see it. Okay? You're going to long for it because you're going to go through these painful times, but you're not going to see it. And, and, and then he says, and men will tell you. People will say, hey, hey, I'm going to see Jesus. Jesus is going to be over here. There'll be all sorts of people that will prophesy his coming, and they'll tell you he's going to be in a specific location or come at a certain time, and he says, do not go running off after them. Okay, we want to see Jesus. Wouldn't you love to see Jesus? I mean, physically see him somehow? I mean, we all would want that, but what Jesus is saying here, he goes, don't go running off after someone that tells you here he is or there he is because he says, that's not the way I'm going to return. He says, when he returns, he says, the Son of Man in his day, verse 24, will be like the lightning which flashes and lights up the sky from one end to the other. So the return of Christ is not going to be, if I, came to, if I came here next week, okay, and I told you, yeah, guys, Jesus is going to be at the Moore Park Church next week. <laughs> you know, and I, you know, don't listen to me, okay? You know, that's just my scam to get you over there to make more room in here. You know, that it, it's not going to happen. Whatever it is, you know, no matter who tells you, hey, Jesus is going to be here, Jesus is going to be there, you don't ever listen to that. He says, don't ever go running off after them. Why? He says, because when he returns, it's not going to be like the secret that someone's going to say, hey, I know where he's going to be. Come here so you can see him. He says, it's going to be, you ever seen lightning in a dark sky? You know, I mean, we don't get that here. You know, it's hard to see through the smog or whatever else. But you, you go back in the Midwest or you go, you know, East Coast, and some of the, these, these lightning and thunderstorms are just outrageous. I mean, and, and, and when there's just a dark sky and you just see this bolt of lightning, just it, it talks about how it flashes and lights up the whole sky. It's like, boom, it's just right there in your face. It's like, well, well, well the closest thing we experience is, like if you're uh, watching something in the dark and someone takes a picture with a flash, you know, and it goes off in your eyes. You know, that's the only time we see flashing out here. But that's, that's, uh, well, that kind of flashing. But uh, you, you uh, but the, uh, the idea is, is that flashing of the sky, you know, it's just, boom, it's in your face. You're not going to miss it. It's, it's unmistakable. It lights up the whole sky. He's in the same way. That's the way the return of Christ is. Okay, so don't worry about missing it. Okay? You're not going to miss it. And don't go running off when someone says, I got some secret information, and this is where Jesus is going to be. Okay, you understand that? I mean, I know a lot of you that grew up in church, this is common knowledge to you. You're going, oh, you know, I learned this in Sunday school. I know, but you've got to understand, for, for a lot of people, this is new. Um, 
And, and, and plus, you know, nowadays in a lot of churches, we, we don't really teach a lot of theology, and you don't go through, you know, in depth to understand it. A lot of times we assume that everyone knows this stuff. Okay, just don't go running off anyone that tells you Jesus is here, Jesus is there. Um, and, and, and some of you may go, well, well, who does that? You guys, it happens today. In, uh, in, in the year 2000, on, on, uh, on April 2nd, on TBN, Benny Hinn predicted. You know, some of you guys remember that. In April of, of, of 2000, he, he said, hey, Jesus is going to appear physically on the stage at my crusade in, in, in Nairobi, Kenya, on the 29th and 30th of April. You'll all want to come. And, and he, told, uh, he told Paul Crouch, he goes, I may even be able to bring back a video of Jesus when I return. And then all these people with big hair are going, woo, woo, you know. And, uh, you know, they get all... Uh, they get all hyped up and, oh, he's going you know, to appear on this stage and everything else. And, and, and even on that show, he explained, he says, hey, and we do have footage of Jesus. We have footage of Jesus when he was in Romania one time in the back of the church. I've got a video of it. And you're just like, uh, you know, I didn't mail in for that video. Why? Because of what this passage says. Jesus says, I'm not returning that way. That's not the way I'm coming back. So don't go running off to Kenya because someone says, I'm going to appear there on his stage. He says right there, don't listen to that. That's not the way Christ is going to return. And others, others have, uh, have predicted. Do you, do you realize that the Jehovah's Witnesses began with a prediction of the return of Christ? Charles Taze Russell, what he said was that in 1874, he said that, uh, that, that Christ... Uh, came invisibly to set up his kingdom, and then he predicted that in 1914, he says, Jesus is going to return visibly. So get ready. That's how the Jehovah's Witnesses began. Then in 1914, uh, he didn't come. So <laughs> what, he said was he, what he said was, well, he came back invisibly again. But look to 1918. Because in 1918, you'll see him physically. He's going to annihilate the wicked. Get ready for 1918. Nothing happened. So then he said, look to 1925. And he says, 1925, that's when Christ is going to return. In fact, he, uh, he wrote a book that the second, uh, second president, uh, Rutherford, wrote the book, Millions Living Now Will Never Die all point to this 1925 date. Okay, now when he was wrong in 1925, they did lose three-fourths of their membership. Okay, so after that, okay, well, you're 0 for 3, we give up. And three-fourths of them left, okay, you know, 1925. But then they said, well, you know, maybe we're a little off on the 25th day. Look to somewhere in the 1940s. Okay, because they still stuck to, they said, okay, Christ returned invisibly in 1914. And then they said in Matthew 23, uh, no, in Matthew uh, 24, in Matthew, <laughs> I'm not going to make a bad prediction here. Matthew, yeah, it's, it's Matthew 24. Matthew 24, verse uh, 34. Okay, Matthew 24, 34, it says, I tell you the truth, this generation will not pass away until all these things have happened. And it's talking about the return of Christ, and it's saying, and, and, and what they're saying is they're saying, well, Christ returned in 1914, and the Bible says there in Matthew 24 that that, uh, that generation won't pass away until they actually see all those things fulfilled. So they said, if you take 1914 and a generation, which is about 30 to 40 years, that'll tell you that somewhere in the 1940s is when he'll return physically. Now, uh, what they did at that point, because they were so sure of it, that's when they built a mansion there in San Diego. They built a mansion in order to house the resurrected prophets, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and all the prophets were going to live there. You know, so they built this big mansion because they're so sure that something is going to happen in the 40s. But then, uh, you know, obviously they never showed up, and, uh, and so the president moved into the mansion. But, um, <laughs> but then what they did was in, in 1945, they said, okay, it says a generation. And they said, well, a generation could mean 
80 years as well. So then they said, we promise he'll come back before 1994. Because if you take 1914, you add 80 years to it, then 1994, and they bought themselves another 40 years. But what happened was in 1966, they made another prediction. They said, we just figured out. We just figured out that in 1975, it will have been exactly 6,000 years since the creation of Adam and Eve. And so 1975 will be the year when Christ returns. And I don't know if any of you guys remember this, you know, but, but they start getting hyped up in 1975. That's going to be the big year. And uh, obviously nothing happened. And so, again, there was a mass exodus from, from the Jehovah's Witnesses. And they backpedaled and said, oh, you know what? There might have been a gap between the time Adam was created and the time of Eve. And so we may have a few more years here. Most people didn't buy it. It did not, you know, restore the numbers to the Jehovah's Witnesses. But that's when they really started pushing their door-to-door -door evangelism. And they started growing in numbers. And, and now, again, millions of people are following this teaching. Um, now, but they did say, you know, that 1994 date was still going to stick um, until 1995, of course. And then in, uh, in 1995, what they did was that they said, well, the generation wasn't really 30 to 40 years. It wasn't really 80 years. That word generation could mean an age, which who knows how long that is. And so they've left it indefinite, and that's where they are today. So you, you look at the history of something like that, and you go, well, no one really says, here's Christ, here's Christ. Do you know how many millions of people are, are following that? And why? A lack of knowledge, number one. But you guys, I, as I, I laugh about this stuff, and I go, man, it, it, it's really sad, but, but here's the thing. Here's, here's what's really sad and what really bugged me today as I, as I thought about this. And... Um, because I think, why, why do so many people believe some of these things um, that are out there? And I tried to think, if I were not a Christian today, and if I were searching for truth, try, try to think this way. I know most of you guys, you know, a lot of you guys grew up in church, and you've been Christians for years, and you found something, and you know that God is real and everything else, but try to put yourself in the shoes of someone who doesn't believe, who doesn't know anything about Christianity, and pretend you're a person that's just searching for truth right now. You just want to know the truth. Where would you look for it? I mean, seriously, think about it. Where would you look? Would you really look at the Christian church for the truth? I mean, why would you? I try to think that this really made me sad this afternoon. I mean, at first I, I thought this week, I thought, oh, it's just a bunch of head knowledge I'm going to give to people this week so that they don't get fooled. But then this, this afternoon, it just absolutely rocked me because I thought, why do people go all these different directions and not to, to Christianity? And I thought, well, if I weren't a believer, would I go to Christianity? Because if I didn't have any church background, I'd think, okay, Christianity, TBN. I don't want any of that. And I think, well, uh, how about the local church, the local Christian church, and wh what's the local Christian church? Everyone's just saying, oh, you know, this pastor's in it for the money, this pastor's sleeping with that guy's wife, this guy's doing that. This. Why, why would I want to go to that? And then most of the Christians I know, I mean, they, they can't even keep their own family together. Most of the Christians I know, do they really have a passion for God, or are they just, they just kind of attend church and do their deal? I mean, what, what would really attract me to Christianity? And I started looking at my own life, and I thought, man, why would my neighbors be attracted to, to my life? You know, and you start thinking, gosh, is there anything there? I think if I, if I were looking for truth, I would think, well, you know, I, I don't know if it's true. I don't do all the study, but look at those Jehovah's Witnesses. They're knocking door to door. You know, at least they're sacrificing something. I'd probably go to that before I'd go to Christianity, because what, what do Christians really sacrifice? If I wanted a good family, I'd probably go to Mormonism. And go, you know, they, they seem to keep their families together a little better. If I wanted passion, people that are, that are really passionate about what they believe, I'd probably go to Islam. Because, you know, I don't know what they all believe, but, but man, are they passionate. I mean, really, would you really go to the church and Why? I mean, this is so sad. This, is, this was really bugging me. 
And I understand, man, some of you, you do, you live these lives where the people around you, they really see it, and, and that's why they've come. Some of you are in this room because you saw the truth in someone else's life. You saw a Christian that was so fired up and their heart really was for God. It wasn't a show. It wasn't a ritual. It wasn't a routine. It was something real. It was genuine. God really made a difference in their life. But I'm telling you, that's, that's rare. That's a rare thing nowadays. I mean, how many churches you go to, sit through service and just go, man, that was dead. There was no life in the people. There was no life up front. There was just nothing there. I think people move on. And um, I don't know. I, I ramble enough about that. But why, why would someone come here? I, I, let me just tell you. You know, why I believe what I believe is because it's true. Okay? And it, it's, not, it's not because Christians were so wonderful to me or this or that or anything else. But it, it, uh, right now at this point in my life, it, it really is because of truth. And it is because of uh, using my God-given mind and really studying it through and thinking it through. And absolutely, there's an element of faith to it. I and mean, without faith, it's impossible to please God. But even what Jesus says here, for example... Verse 25, when he says, but first he must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. He explains, he tells his disciples, yeah, I'm going to return again, but first I've got to suffer and be rejected by this generation. Do you understand that uh, Jesus was explained to his disciples, look, just like in the Old Testament, you read, um, go to Daniel. Daniel is in the Old Testament, one of the minor prophets. It's towards the end. Daniel... Uh, Daniel chapter 7 talks about this coming kingdom that we've been talking about. Okay, in Daniel 7, uh, verse 27, it says, Then the sovereignty, power, and greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven will be handed over to the saints, the people of the Most High. His kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom, and all rulers will worship and obey him. See that in Daniel 7, he's talking about that kingdom, the thing that everyone's longing for, that time when Christ reigns and, and all the rule is, is under him here on the earth. That talks about that in Daniel 7. It also talks about it in Daniel 9. Now, in Daniel 9, though, it talks about something that will take place before that end. In fact, I put that in your bulletins, if you didn't, or, or they may have handed it to you with your bulletins. You have a little half sheet that, uh, that has Daniel 9, 25 to 26 on it. Okay, look at the sign that says Daniel 9, 25, 26 on it. And I've shared this before, but it's just, uh, it's another one of those things that really solidifies what I believe. Okay, that it's not because, oh, you know, Christians are so nice or they're so different or this or that. A lot of it just boils down to truth. Okay, it's just stuff that I can't explain away. Daniel 9, verse 25, uh, it says this. No one understand this from the issuing of the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until the anointed one, the ruler, comes. There will be seven sevens and 62 sevens. It will be rebuilt with streets and a trench in times of trouble. After the 62 sevens, the anointed one will be cut off and will have nothing. The people of the ruler who will come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end will come like a flood. War will continue until the end and desolations have been decreed. Okay, so it talks about this, uh, verse 26, the, the anointed one that will be cut off. Okay, this is before the ruling comes this cutting off. Same thing like Jesus was saying, that there, before he would reign, there would be this suffering and this rejection. But look at what it says. First it says, in verse 25, from the issuing of a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. Okay, now Daniel was written uh, like five... Uh, probably 580 B.C., okay, before the time of Christ, or a little less than 600 years before the birth of Christ, Daniel was written. Okay, that's a long time ago. Okay, 600 years before the birth of Christ. Now, now what he says is that you can count it off. He says, from the issuing of the decree to rest restore and rebuild Jerusalem. At that time, the, Jerusalem was destroyed, was in shambles, but there was going to be a decree at some point in history. Well, what happened was, what, if you read Nehemiah chapter 2, it explains 
that it, it says in Nehemiah chapter 2, it says, on the 20th year of the reign of King Artaxerxes, he actually gives this decree to rebuild and restore Jerusalem. Now, Daniel, you know, you know 100 years before that, said one day there's going to be a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. From that time, you can start counting down the days before the Messiah is you know, uh, uh, cut off. Now, we know from history that Artaxerxes began his reign in 465 B.C. So 20 years into his reign, we have uh, 444 B.C., and it says in, in Nehemiah chapter 2 that it was in the month of Nisan that, that he gave this decree, and the decree would have come on the first day of the year or first day of that month because there's no other date there. So Nisan 1, 444 B.C., which if you put that, that's the Jewish calendar, you put that in our, our Gregorian calendar, and that makes the date March 5th, 444 B.C. Now it says from that date, you can, there'll be seven weeks and 62 weeks. So uh, 69 weeks. Okay, so, so first it says the seven weeks. Um, the seven weeks is 49 years. A, a, week, a week could refer to uh, 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 seven days, or it can refer to seven years. Okay, because they, they mark things off by seven years, seven year periods back then. And so you got seven weeks, which could be 49 years of the rebuilding of Jerusalem. Then it says, then after the 62 weeks, the Messiah will be cut off. So you've got the seven weeks plus the 62 weeks, which is 69 weeks. You multiply that, uh, you multiply that by seven, and you end up with 483 years. Do, do you got that? You kind of follow up the first, you got 62 weeks, which is 434 years, and you add that to the 49 years that he was talking about before, that's 483 years. Their calendar, the Jewish calendar, had 360 days, so you multiply that, and then that equals 173,880 days. So if you take that date according to our calendar, March 5th, 444 BC, and you add 173,880 days, you end up with a date of March 30th, 33 AD. Okay, and that's the date that historians will say that Jesus rode into Jerusalem. It was before the Passover, the time Passover, that Jesus rode into Jerusalem on the donkey, the triumphal entry. And what happens that week? He's cut off. He's crucified. Daniel prophesied that almost 600 years before it happened to the day. He said, look, this is going to happen. He's going to come in. He's going to be cut off on that day. And then the city and the temple is going to be destroyed, which is exactly what the Romans did after that. You, you see, I look at that and, and I go, okay, with, with pinpoint precision, God predicted the coming of the Messiah. And so then you've got these prophecies after that that talk about this last week, the 70th week, and the seven years of tribulation, you know, these end times that we're talking about, that I know some of you are tired waiting for that. But I go, no, these guys waited 600 years. You know, and even before that, there were many prophecies before that. That, you know, I mean, this goes back to Adam and Eve about the coming of the Messiah. I mean, they waited for thousands of years before the Messiah came the first time. And now it's been a couple thousand years years, you know, and the second coming hasn't come. But I say, you know, God's proven to me, this book has proven to me to be true. It's proven itself. I go, man, I can't, I can't look at this and say this is just coincidence. Well, you know, lucky guess. I just go, man, that's, that's fascinating to me. I mean, we use that word a lot, but this is truly fascinating. And I've never heard anyone explain this away to me in, in any way that makes sense. If you want to look more detail on how we calculate the Jewish calendar and the Gregorian, that's in the back, but you can look at that at home to, to see that I'm not lying. But the, the, whole, the whole thing is, okay, that's why I believe in God. That's why I believe he's going to return again. It's certainly not because of the testimony of the Christian church. Um, but my prayer is that now that I absolutely am convinced of this thing, and I believe that he's going to return any time, man, I, I, have, I have this debt. I have this desire just to help prepare people for the return of Christ and prepare his church, his bride, because he's coming back for us um, for that time and for us to be people that, that are more passionate than the Muslims, that sacrifice more than the Jehovah's Witnesses, whose families are, are more together than the Mormons. Why? Because we have the truth. We have the truth. And 
And that we would live lives based upon this knowledge, based upon this truth, and it's not just a bunch of head knowledge, but this is something we die for. I mean, it's going to happen. He's proven it. And to me, nothing else makes sense on this earth. I mean, I've looked into the other religions, and if something else would make sense or even come close to this, yeah, I'd look into it. I'd, I'd switch. I want truth. Okay? I just do. And if you have some knowledge that I don't, you go, no, let me explain to you why you're wrong, and I've found this other book and this other philosophy that makes more sense. I'll switch. I really will. I'm not going to follow a lie. At the same time, having gone with this and followed this Jesus and this scripture and everything else, it's totally transformed my life. You know, my prayer life and the things I ask for and things happening, it just, it just doesn't, nothing else makes sense to me. I know this stuff to be true. I mean, it only makes sense that, that, that this Christ and that coming and that dying, you know, because some say, well, you know, why, why would he come and die? Well, because it's what the scripture said. And it only makes sense when you look at the Old Testament, you know, and I've, I've been reading through uh, Leviticus this week and talking about the sacrifices, and, and, I, and, and you see all the way back from thousands of years ago how they would sacrifice these animals, and these animals were, were, were going to take, you know, you know they, were, they were atoning for the sins of the people because God hated their sins so much. You know, and then Isaiah has that passage in 53 talking about this one who was going to, you know, die for the sins of the world and everything else. And, it, and then Daniel says, oh, and then this is going to happen. He's going to be cut off on that date. To me, it's like, this is the only thing that makes sense, that Jesus really was that lamb that was prophesied about, that the Jews were sacrificing those lambs from way back to show a picture of this one that was going to come, that he did come and he did pay for my debt on the cross, that he paid for it all. And that he is going to return one day to judge the world. And I want to be ready for that. And I want to live for that. And I don't want to get too caught up in the things of this world. And as I talk about this stuff, I don't know how it, how it applies to your life. In fact, uh, I've gone kind of way over my time tonight. But uh, would, you just, um, would you just bow your heads for a second? And would you just spend some time right now, just you pray to God yourself. And um, before we sing to him, you just pray and just take a couple minutes and just ask God whatever you need to do based upon what you just heard.